Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Give a warm welcome to Mary. Told her she starts too many rumors. <laughs> I'm Mary, a uh, grateful, nervous, recovering alcoholic. <clears throat> I'm also a member of the CIA, Catholic Irish Alcoholics. Um, Cromwell, as Anne said, is, has been my home group since I first came into this fellowship. Um, what else do you need? To, oh, my sobriety date is July 4th, 1974. That changed. I came in originally March 19th, but I'll get around to telling you why, honestly, I had to change the date. <clears throat> I didn't want to become an alcoholic. I grew up with alcoholism. I saw I was under the the feelings that it brought down to me. Um, And I wasn't going to be like that. And for the better part of my life, oh, I'm also the oldest of four children in in my immediate family. Uh, And I was always told that I should be setting the example. And, you know, without leadership to show what the example is, I have no idea. But I became the person who helped everybody who uh, wasn't drinking. But, you know, when we went to a party or whatever, I got made sure everybody else got home. I didn't need a drink, as a lot of people in this room can probably attest to. They know that I've got the loudest mouth at a party without a drink. Uh, so I didn't need it as a social lubricant. Um, my drinking was all one of escape the feelings, escape the emotions. When I found alcohol, uh, from the first time that I, re- when I, whenever I crossed the line, yes, I had had occasional drinks, but it was not a big deal. Um, but my escapism started with, you know, marrying the first guy that came down the pike to get out of the house, had four kids, um, discovered that wasn't the best relationship in the whole world. Uh, by the time I got here, oh, and I want to thank all you ladies that are in the room today. When I got sober, I thought I was the only female drunk in the whole world. So thank you for joining me. I felt, I do, I, you know, it, I think I'm going to talk about my miracles today. Um, when they started. Uh, and I know I'm jumping all over the place because I had lunch with four delight, three delightful people. And we were talking about programs. Funny, huh? And it, it triggered a lot more thoughts. So God only knows what you're going to get. And I have turned it over. That's the first, the, the only time I can honestly tell you that I have taken the third step. Um, whatever comes out is his plan, not mine. So, uh, the marriage was not good, but I was in control. I helped, you know, did it all. Um, When I first started to drink, and I remember it so well, um, I was married to a cop, and a cop was killed, um, murdered, and went to the wake and funeral, as we all did. And there was a lot of booze around. And that was the time I found out that booze took away all the hurt. It was probably just about the time that ex-husband decided he was going to not be a regular person anymore. Um, So there was a lot of abuse, verbal and physical. By the time I got here, I I was a nothing. 
absolutely nothing. I had, I didn't even know what my feelings were when I first was told that I had, um, I said something about I was angry about something. One of my good friends in the fellowship said, hell no, you're in, in rage. I didn't know the difference. I couldn't tell you what feelings were other than I, I was nothing. Uh, and I had heard all the words and all the, the nonsense about how bad I was that I believed it. I believed it. I had nowhere to go. So when I found out that alcohol took care of those feelings, they didn't go away, but they didn't hurt as much. And I didn't care. It numbed me. And that's what I needed. I needed to be numb. And for a, quite a few years, that probably alcohol was my friend. It saved me from doing a lot of other stupid things that I would, was pretty capable of doing. You know, I did want to run my car up onto a pole. I just didn't have the nerve. So the situation at home with four kids is not getting good. It's getting worse because dear old dad's getting worse. And the abuse was going over to them. They're in school. First one gets into some counseling, and the parents were called in. Um, that was when I learned about if you don't tell the truth to a counselor, nothing's going to happen. But I tried. I, I just, for some reason, that time I felt like Maybe there's somebody that can help me with this. I didn't even know what this was. And it, I wasn't talking about the alcohol. I was talking about the living situation. Well, I did try to be honest, and I paid for it the whole next week because my spouse did not want any truth be told. So, well, what's going to happen? And finally stopped. Now we've got to the third child, and he's in trouble, and we're going back to counseling. When I walked in, and here's where my miracles start. I walked in to, oh, yeah, that was the first one. Um, the counselor that we had had before said, Mary, I'll see you, but I will not see him. He's going to go down the hall and see Dr. So-and-so. For some reason, he said, yes, he would agree to it. That left me home free with this counselor. She built, brings me in, sets me next to her desk, and the first thing she said was, Mary, what are we going to do about your drinking? I didn't know her. But she knew. She remembered, apparently, like a lot of good people do what was said by children that were in groups, apparently. And they must have been saying things like, Mom's had a few too many drinks. Um, and it was true. You know, I had days when my children would find me asleep taking a nap on the kitchen floor. You think that's normal drinking? Um I always had a back problem, and when I would come, they thought I was addicted to the TV, the soap operas, because I'd be laying on the couch watching them. Not so. I was trying to sober up. Uh, I had a day that I will never forget. Please, God, I don't. Um, I had a bottle on the table of one of the big ones, and the package store hadn't opened. And I knew in my the bottom of my soul that if I cracked that seal, I was going to need to get another bottle. That's normal, not normal drinking. Um, but I cracked the seal, and I got another bottle. And it was always in case I ran out. Well, you know. Right from the beginning, if one drink was going to make me feel okay, two were going to make me better. And it was instant addiction. 
Uh, we were talking at lunch. I uh, never got into any drugs because I didn't want to get addicted to drugs because I was supposed to have the pain pills for my back. Nobody ever said that alcohol was addicting. It was a social drink. It was okay. So I started with the counseling. The first thing she said to me was, Mary, I don't know much about this, but there's an organization out there called Alcoholics Anonymous, or AA, and they're going to be available to help you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you will let them. She knew me. I was so used to doing things my own way. Uh, and I say that so strongly for me today that I still have to let you. And I've had to let you guys do a lot for me lately. So, the st- <laughs> I started out from the Weatherfield Friday night group. But I didn't get to a meeting on Friday night. I was told... Um, There was a meeting in Hartford at Our Lady of Sorrows at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, don't remember. Well, I got there because my pattern would be to drink before friend husband came home so I wouldn't have to deal with him. (laughs) Except, you know, the dealing with him was a lot worse when I was drunk. Um... Sorry. I had the feeling sitting outside that church, there was a sign that said Senior Citizen Center. I had no idea what a drunk looked like, other than I knew what I did. Um, I see all these people going into church. And finally, another miracle comes up, and I'm told by something somewhere, some feeling, that you have to get into that church because you may not have another chance. And frightened I was, but I got out of the car and went into the church. I didn't know what that was about then. I do now. That was God. That was God remaining anonymous. And the whole series of things that took place, again, I didn't know it, but it happened. Um... There was a fellow from Springfield, I guess, celebrating a fifth anniversary. <clears throat> that night I received the biggest piece of chocolate cake I had ever had. <laughs> and nobody said why, but they told me that if I ate it, I wouldn't want to drink. And that sounded good. <laughs> Instant addiction to, to-, to chocolate, you know. <laughs> So I substitute, but it was the sugar they were talking about. The next miracle is there were two Weathersville Weathers women speaking at that meeting. I thought I was the only one, and now here's two of them. And yes, I compared. I did not identify because if one of those stories was okay, I could. I stood a chance of maybe getting sober. Um. My first sponsor was in that room that night, and she was there only because she was sponsoring someone else that they needed an extra meeting that week. So now I've got women. I've got a sponsor. I didn't know that at the time. She told me later. Um, Oh, yeah. (laughs) There were no, may I do this? No, you will do this. All suggestions, but damn well you betters. And they worked. Um, So, uh, just for the record, Alan from Weathersfield always says, we don't get sober in in so many words until we're absolutely ready. Not one day or one sooner or later. Well, the meeting I had with that counselor was on a Tuesday. My home group is Monday. Monday. No, sorry, messed that one up. I saw her on a Monday, and the 
woman I called did not tell me about the Cromwell Monday night meeting. She told me about Tuesday. So that's where I started. Um, and then by the time I got hooked into that Weathersfield Friday night group, I had a steady round of meetings. There were eight or nine a week. And there were no, I don't feel good, I think I'll stay home stuff. The the bus is moving from Abdows. We're all going to Torrington or wherever to speak, and the bus is leaving. Meet us. And that's how it was. And I finally got to start finding a little bit about me. My life in sobriety was not easy the first couple of years. Um, The only thing I didn't do in regards to no major decisions, was ex-husband threatened to leave the house. And my pattern was I was supposed to beg him to come back because I was afraid of raising children alone. I didn't. I knew he wasn't going to pay anything. And I had no job. You know, all of this stuff, it was miserable. And you guys got blamed and rightly so, because you gave me the courage not to allow him back in that home. And I progressed, and there was all sorts of things going on. A house got broken into, uh, really kind of destroyed. I was at a meeting. The kids weren't home. I didn't want to bother anybody to come to my house and help me. They were... The next thing I know, there's a caravan coming across the Glastonbury Bridge. Be amazed how quick a bunch of drunks can do a job. Would have taken me two weeks. But, you know, it's, I, my motto is always, if the going gets tough, reach for a drunk. We know how to do it. We can help each other. While one's down, The other five are up, and it's just amazing. They told me to get active, and I did more than once uh, through all the service chairs, GSR, intergroup, DCM, and back again. Oh, answering service. You know, I've been there. And all of it helped. All of us, all of it helped to keep me sober one day at a time. I can go through a lot of stuff that's happened, but I'm going to bring you up to date to what happened in my life. And again, it's God. Um, Almost four years ago, going on, eh, almost four years, I lost my daughter, her significant other, and my son within 30 days. My daughter succumbed to this disease. Uh, You know, it gets them. It gets us. She was, growing up, one of my best teachers, my best um, supporter for, you know, she, when the phone, when I would come home at night and she'd say, Ma, so and so call, so and so. She listed them in the matter, in the uh, order of who she thought needed the help the most, the fastest. She knew our program. She could talk it, she could talk it, but she was never able to walk it. And that's heartbreaking. That's tough to live with. But that's what happened. People came through. There's people in this room that were at the wake when my daughter decides it's going to be a blizzard that night. Um, the people showed up. They were there to help me. They were there. Some of them drove up to Massachusetts when my sister died. I mean, I was having people drop off one right after another. About a year later, my girlfriend died in Chicago. I had sponsored her into the program. I'm the godmother for one of the children. And she died suddenly. So I've got, I'm getting nailed, and I have nothing except you guys and and God to help me. And I guess God decided he needed to intervene. And the next thing you know, I'm driving in downtown Hartford, 
I was supposed to be meeting my sister to go to the Cape in East South Windsor at 6. At about 10, I guess, she was really nervous. I was down, driving around Main Street in Hartford Asylum, a big, huge block, and I don't remember a thing. I came to on Main Street. <clears throat> I mean, I could have been in other places, too, but I, I wasn't there. Um, came through on, too, on Main Street and was aware I wasn't supposed to be there and decided to drive back home to Rocky Hill. Got in the house. I was told afterwards that I did a lousy parking job. All the windows in my car were da- rolled down. My pocketbook was in the back seat. Uh, you know, not typical of my, my situation. God bless you. Um, the troops were out looking for me, and, and I don't remember exactly what got me to the hospital that day, but apparently... It's been no, uh, mentioned that, my, God bless my son. You were, I said, it's, the lights were out, but nobody was home. He said, Ma, the lights were, uh, were out. Nobody was there. Um, so anyway, they couldn't find anything wrong, sent me home. A week later, I'm back in there. Same kind of thing happened. I have had every test in the book, more than once, spinal taps three times, brain surgery, um, fortunately before what we've been reading about this weekend, um, couldn't find out what was causing all this. So I had to decide not to drive anymore. I gave up my car. All I could think of is there was no guarantees that was, this was going to happen again. And God forbid I should hurt somebody else. So no more driving, and we get back into a nursing home. And I was spent a nursing home, in a nursing home one full year. Um, by the time I got there, I couldn't write, I couldn't read, I couldn't, everything had to be relearned. And I still got some deficits, as you can see. Um, or here, I forget things. Um, <laughs> but as the speaker last night said, you know, hey, uh, it's the age too, folks. Um, so there's my story up to today. Um, I keep doing things that are out of the norm. Last week I woke up with an eye that I couldn't see out of. I spent every single day at a doctor's office at the retinal consultants um, trying to find out what's causing the blindness in my right eye. We can't find it. So now I'm being led around a little bit. But God's doing all this for a reason. And, you know, if if I'm not mistaken, he still wants me to be able to ask for help. I gotta tell you, I think he's got a warped sense of humor. Uh, but I'll do it because you people have taught me through the steps, through Big Book, through all of the stuff that we offer here to help each other live instead of dying. I live one day at a time and I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much, Mary. It's great to hear you. Um, and Joe is going to take over from here. Uh, hi, my name is Joe. I'm an alcoholic. And um, I think I met the next speaker, 1981, possibly 1982. And it's only in like the last five years that we've become close. It takes Charlie a little while to warm up to people. And uh, he'll get me back. Um, And as Kathy was introducing Howard last night and she was kind of gushing over him, I leaned over to Charlie and I said, you don't have to worry, I'm not going to do that tomorrow. 
But I kind of lied. Um, there's probably not a man in AA that I respect more than him, and that's why I asked him to speak, Charlie. I'm getting to that age, true. I, I, I bought a cheat sheet because uh, I can't remember anymore. Um, <clears throat> and I will get even with Joe. Uh, and thank you very much, Mary. Uh, Charlie, alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety. Thank you. My sobriety date is January 15th, 1975. Uh, <clears throat> last night was uh, right from the beginning. Howard was involved in my life, uh, so last night was very special to me. Uh, everybody knows I don't like to do this. Uh, uh, I, I've not been thinking about it because I didn't want to break out in hives like I usually do. Uh, but that's uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, I had a typical abnormal childhood. Um, and, and I say that today because people talk about uh, dysfunctional, and then they'd say what it was, and I'm saying, geez, that wasn't bad at all. You know? um, so I guess that's how it was. And... and um, when I was 18, the company my father was involved in was going to have a shop picnic, and, and I went to help set up, and I helped set up the beer. And um, as a result of my conduct, uh, a lady involved in that company uh, decided that somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous should talk to me. Um, when I was 21, a good friend of the family uh, said to me, you've got to be careful. You don't drink like other people. And I thought, he had a hell of a nerve, um, you know, because he was a heavy hitter. Um, but that's how things were, um, you know. Uh, and, and I have to admit, I, I've had a lot of chances and a lot of opportunities, and a lot of people tried to help me uh, all my life <clears throat> in a variety of things. Uh, you know, I'm going to need that water. You know why people get dry when they talk? Me, because I don't like to tell the truth. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, I had a lot of opportunities, and, and I never took advantage of the opportunities. I took advantage of people. I took advantage of situations. But I never took advantage of the opportunities. And I was in trouble with alcohol right from the start, and I know that today because I always wanted alcohol to do something for me. I didn't drink because I was thirsty. I drank because I wanted something to happen, uh, and, and that was the problem. Uh, I took, uh, I married the girl next door, uh, much to her parents' chagrin. Uh, her father didn't, after the wedding, her father didn't talk to me for a year. Uh, I was not a nice guy, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and she said she married me because she thought I had direction, and and a, and a purpose. Uh, she didn't know it was fear and arrogance. Uh, and she had already said I do before she got to that point. Uh, you know. And and again, I had a lot of a, a lot of great chances. Uh, I was working for a company, and and um, uh, I didn't think they were moving me along fast enough. So I went to work for a company down in Philadelphia. And my mother called and said, "You ought to come home. Your wife's in the hospital, and she's going to have a baby." And you ought to be here. And I, I came back from Philadelphia to, to Waterbury, and my wife was there. And I walked in, and she said, I want to call the whole thing off. Well, it wasn't the baby, because it was too late for that. <laughs> but it was me, because, you know, I'm not the person that she wanted. Uh, and my conduct and my activities were just, you know, weren't making for help, happy, a happy world. Uh, my daughter, Melissa, was born, and, and um, I did not move my wife to Philadelphia in the interim, I took another job and I moved her to San Jose, California. Because uh, it's going to get better, you know? That little geographical cure. And, and San Jose was good for weeks. It was really good. Um, and then I found that place where they drank like I wanted to drink and I didn't stand out. And then things got bad. Um, and things got bad in a hurry. You know, when you live in Connecticut and your in-laws live in Connecticut and your parents live in Connecticut, when she goes home to mom, it's not that bad. When you live in California and she goes home to mom, it gets expensive. Um, 
you know, so, uh, you know, she'd had it with me again, you know, as most people. Uh, I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous out there. Uh, the California Highway Patrol was not thrilled with my driving. Um, and I went to a meeting, and there was a guy there, and he spoke, and he was pretty old, probably about my age. And um, I thought, you know, I- I'm glad they have that thing. And if I ever get to that point, I may, I may go to that, but, or I could tell people about it. But, see, that wasn't my problem. My problem was life. Uh, you know, things did not go my way, you know. You've heard about restless, irritable, and discontent. Well, that was me. Uh, and, and as again, I had another opportunity. I had opportunities out there that, you know, if I told you about them, it would sound like bragging uh, because they were, they were just magnificent. And I drank my way out of this position. Um, I resigned uh, ahead of them firing me, and I... Uh, you know, uh, I, I should back up. Uh, my wife went home, and you know, did you ever have that? Uh, married guys will know this that sinking feeling that something's going wrong, and you know, the hair stands up on the back of your neck because you know you're in trouble and you don't know why. Well, the phone rang, and it was my wife, and she said, I'm coming back. Meet me at San Francisco International Airport. Uh, I'm going to give you another chance. Uh, so I said, okay. Now, I don't want to say how my life was going, but I always carried extra clothes in the car. And um, I, I, I'm supposed to be working, and I would call in, and they'd say, where are you? You know, um, I didn't even know what day it was. What do you mean, where am I? Uh, so I would go, I had this laundry, and I bought it in, and if they said it looked familiar, I figured it was clean, I'd wear it. If they said they didn't, then I would give it them, to them to clean and that's how I was living. Uh, but she was coming home, so I figured I'd better clean the place up, you know. So I, I, there wasn't a lot of dishes or anything, so I put what was there, I put it in the dishwasher, and I loaded the dishwasher, and I sat down on the couch to contemplate life. You know, I must have dozed off. And when I woke up, uh, there was these waves in front of me. And... Uh, they weren't waves, they were soap suds. I had put the wrong soap in the dishwasher. And, and I don't know if any of you have ever tried this, but you can't get rid of soap. Uh, you can't flush it down the toilet. You, you can't add water. I mean, it just, it just, but I, I'm, I'm a smart guy, you know, so I unplugged the television and I went out to a bar and had a few drinks just to figure out what was going to happen. I, I don't know when I got back. Um, but the suds were gone and the place sparkled, you know. And, and I just thought it was great, you know. If I figured out how to do it, I'd write a book, you know. So I, uh, I went to the airport and, and, uh, I'm standing there. In those days, you could go out by the, you know, out to the, the concourse. And all of a sudden, this, this woman with a little child in her arms was tugging on my shoulder and she was very pregnant. And, and I said, uh, I didn't recognize her. I said, you know, how did this happen? I'm not very smart with this, you know. Um, uh, <clears throat> our second daughter uh, was born in San Jose, California. And when my wife went into the hospital to have the baby, she could not leave our oldest daughter with me, who was 15 months old, because I couldn't be trusted. She had to leave it with her friend. She had the ba- my second daughter, Nicole, on a, on a Friday and on Sunday, she came home with a brand new baby and Nicole and my oldest daughter, Melissa, and I had to leave because I had to drink. And I'm ashamed of that. I'm still ashamed of that. And I hope I never stop being ashamed of that because I had to drink. You know, things got worse. And as I said, I, you know, I, I, I had a very responsible job and I would wear a suit and, and my physical health was deteriorating, and I would go to a doctor, and they used to say, well, you need to stop drinking. And now they were saying, even if you stop drinking, things are going to get, you know, things are not good. I had another health problem, and, and of course, the alcohol made it worse, and, uh, and that's how it was. I mean, I would stand there, and if I turned quick, my clothes would still be facing in this direction. You know, that's, that's just how it was. Well, I packed them up and I moved them back to Connecticut, not because I was noble and I wanted to get sober or anything like that. It's because I felt if something happened to me, they would be close to her parents and my parents and there would be some help available. And I moved into the east end of Waterbury, um, you know, and, and, and that's how it was. And, and uh, I believe 
<laughs> that that I, I while there I experienced the dark night of the soul. Um, I was sitting between the two children in the in the beds, and I was holding one child's hand, and I said, "How could I have gotten here? You know, this is, wasn't the plan. Uh, I didn't have a plan, but this certainly wasn't it. You know, these were two beautiful children. It was so beautiful they made my heart hurt." And I had a, a lady sleeping in another room who truly cared about me, truly cared about me. But I was lost. I was alone. I couldn't feel love. I didn't know how to love. And I, I ended up having to drink again. I drank again. Uh, you know, uh, when I drank, I looked and I beheld, I, you know, I beheld a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death. But I did not die. I awoke again to the things you people talk about in the book. Fear, terror, bewilderment, and frustration. And I was lost again. I was lost again. You know, and and when things go bad, you know, they're very bad. And and I just didn't know what to do. You know, it was on a Saturday, and Marilyn said to me, well, why don't you try that AA again? You know, because I'd gone to AA, you know. Bartenders used to tell me to go to AA. Uh, you know, well, they'd say, "Here's twenty bucks, you pain in the ass. Go somewhere else and drink." You know, uh, I was just not, a, you know, it was not good. I said, "Well, Marilyn, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing at night now. The lights would make me. I was night blind." And, and uh, she said, "I'll drive you." And, and, and I said, well, what about the kids? She said, I've got a babysitter coming over. I said, well, I don't know what meeting I want to go to. And she had a meeting schedule. And I said, okay, I picked out one. And uh, I don't know, it was Ansonia, Derby, something like that. I, I live in the east end of Waterbury. I'm going to go to Ansonia or Derby. And it was drizzling and, and you know, and we, you know, Route 8 wasn't finished yet. And, and uh, so we started down. I said, we'll never make it in time. She said, we'll pick out another meeting. And I did. Winstead, Connecticut. <laughs> um, you, you can tell I had an honest desire, right? Um, so we turned around and we headed to Winstead. And, and we went all the way through Winstead, Connecticut, to this little church, stone church at the end of town. And we went downstairs and there was a guy at the door and he greeted us. And Bob had, he had one eye that looked right through you and another eye that looked up into space. And... and uh, he said to me, which one is the drunk? And she said, he is. She said, well, don't worry about him, honey. We'll take care of him. There's an al on meeting down the hall. Go and pick him up afterwards. Don't leave him. Uh, and I went in, and, and, and that's how I met Bob, my first sponsor, Bob Shaw. And, uh, you know, was, he said, if I get you a cup of coffee, will you spill it? And I said, I don't know. And that was probably the first honest answer I'd given in a long time. He said, well, we'll see how you do. So we went in there, and it was a, a table of about eight, ten people, and, and uh, this woman came down in an evening gown and started playing the piano, and he yelled at her. Uh, you know, and the meeting started, and Jim started the meeting, and, and uh, uh, as soon as the meeting started, Bob and Herb got in an argument, and, and uh, uh, we sat there, and, and this guy sitting next to me said, you know, that old man's been sober 26 years. You know, he said, he's crazy. And... Uh, and he said, I gotta get out of here. And he left. And to my knowledge, I've never seen that individual again. You know. But I knew there was a guy there, Bob M. And I knew he had the secret because he would say, Don't drink, go to meetings. I knew he had something. He was holding back, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I at the meeting ended and, and he said, If you come back, Bob said, If you come back you'd be welcome here. And I said, Well, okay and and I wish I could tell you I didn't drink from that point on, but that's not the truth. I drank, came back, drank, came back, and and then I didn't drink for a month. And Herbie said to me, you know, you're going to drink again. I said, why? He says, because you're the same miserable person that walked to the door. He says, there's a lot more to this than just not drinking. But I fooled him. I didn't drink that week. I drank a week later. <laughs> and I came back and I said, where you been? I said, well, I drank. And he said, well, we got to take a vote on it if you can stay. And the vote was close. Uh, today I know what they were trying to do was to instill in me that Alcoholics Anonymous and sobriety has value. And if it doesn't have value, you're not going to stay here. Um, I would go to, I knew this old, this old man was nasty. I mean, he was terrible. He would say rude things to me, you know. And uh, 
I knew he was a drunk. I wasn't sure about the rest of you people. I'll tell you what, if, they, if they'd have held hands at the end of the meeting back then, I wouldn't be standing here now. Um, so we, uh, I would go to meetings where he was, and I was sober about 90 days, and he called me and he said, you got to meet me in Plainville on Friday night because I'm speaking and I'm bringing Teddy with me and he's drunk and you got to hold him in the chair while I speak. <laughs> so I went to Plainville and, and Bob was there and he said, I, you're not sober long enough to work with Teddy, you talk. And that's how I spoke for the first time, you know. Um, I don't know what I said, but that's why, I, you know, at the end he said, okay, I'll follow you home. And I said, why, Bob? He said, well, he said, you speak for the first time and nobody throws anything at you. You're going to celebrate and go out and get drunk. And I said, no, I won't, Bob, you know. And, and uh, by the time I got home, the phone was ringing and it was Bob, you know. Um, I wish I could say that, that that's how it went, but, you know, Wives have a terrible habit. They, they start asking questions like, do you love me? Uh, will you ever work again? Uh, uh, you know, these, these things. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I don't know. You know, I, I honestly don't know what's going on. And, and uh, but I did. I went out and got a job, you know, and, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden I got a job, I got money coming in, I got a car, I got money in my pocket, I'm hip and slick, and all of a sudden these meetings don't have the priorities that they once had. And then the meetings faded away, and I faded away, and I picked up a drink, you know. And and the, the place that I spoke at in July, I was a, a patient there in January. And the old man came and visited me up here, him and Bob M., you know, and, and I was ashamed. I wasn't ashamed because I'd let down AA. But this old man had spent a lot of time with me, you know. And I was, if I could have crawled into the floor, I would have crawled into the floor. And he said, Book, you got to go to the meetings where you live. He said, we like to see you in Winstead, but you got to go in Waterbury. So I started, I, you know, Waterbury and I had a little problem. So I, I went all the way. I went Southbury, Southington, Plainville. I, I surrounded Waterbury. You know, when I finally went to meetings in Waterbury, what happened? It was the same damn people. You know, um, well, I started hanging around with the three Nazis, Miller, Anderson, and downtown Ray Brown. And the four of us in a car, there was not a thimble full of mental health. Uh, but we went and we did a lot of things, you know, and, and things got better. And, and uh, you know, um, people say to me, what what uh, was the turning point in your sobriety? I said, Miller moved out of state uh, because he was crazy. Uh, but that's, you know, he did a great thing for me. And most people, Ray Brown came into my living room and sat down and played with my children. I didn't know how to do that. Miller brought me over to his ex-wife's house. And his children were very cold to him. And he said to me when we left, if you don't want that, you got to practice this program where you live. Very, very good lessons. And, and Anderson said to me, you've got to read about this stuff. You've got to not just read it up here. You've got to read it in here. And you've got to apply it in your life. And that's what I started. But I had difficulties. You know, I, I did. Uh, as I said... Uh, I, I was sober about a year, and Marilyn came to me, and she said, you know, you're not a very loving person. And I understand that, but your children don't. And I had to work on that. Uh, you know, uh, you guys, uh, Danny Ryan in Hartford used to say when he got to Alcoholics Anonymous, he thought the Lord's Prayer said, lead us not into Penn Station. <laughs> sounded good to me. Uh, and, and two guys that took... Excuse me, the two rays, um, there was a meeting, there was an Oxford meeting down in, in uh, New Milford, and, and on Monday nights they would take me to this meeting. Of course, the Oxford group had, had long been disbanded and they and changed its name, but they called it that because they read from the book that was first read before there was a big book. They read from Emmett Fox's Sermon on the Mount. And there were many people there, and they, they weren't just alcoholics, there were other people who wanted something better. You know, and for years I could not figure out what, how Alcoholics Anonymous in New York got a hold of Sermon on the Mount, and and only in the last few years I read that that Emmett Fox's secretary son was AA number ten in New York City, and that's how the association came to be. And um, 
and also that many of the Catholic clergy, because it was not allowed in those days, would go listen to Emmett Fox and read his, his literature. Um, it, it's just, it seems to me when, when I hit a void, things are revealed to me. And, and that's how it was. You know, and things come and go. You know, we, we moved to Wolcott and, and, you know, um, my little girls were growing up and they got to be in eighth grade and they all started looking like Dolly Parton and, and, and these, these boys started showing up at my house and, you know, and, and I'd say, I'm going to kill these kids, you know, and, and Marilyn would say, shut up, book. One of these kids may be your son-in-law someday. And, you know, and, and then they got into high school and it got worse. I swear they went out into the back and they said, is there a loser in 150 miles? And he showed up at my house to take out my daughter. Uh, I'm putting oil in their cars for them to take my daughters out in these death traps on a date, you know. And Marilyn, in her wisdom, said, "Shut up, book. One of these kids may be your son-in-law someday." Um, and they got out of high school, and, and you know, and, and they went to college, and, and both of them became uh, social workers, uh, you know. And when they had to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, they called my friend Tom, and he took them to meetings. And when they needed to study abnormal psychology, they came home and looked at me, you know. And, and, and that's how it was. And, and uh, you know. Uh, I got a job, and uh, the company was going to be purchased by another company, and the, and the deal fell through. But the new company wanted me, and, and I went to work for them. And uh, I traveled all over the United States. Uh, you know, I was down in Philadelphia. Wherever I went, I, I, I would plan on, on going to a meeting. Because yeah, the idea of me sitting in a hotel room at night, you know, was there was not a lot of mental health, you know. And... and uh, so I did, and, and uh, I called back on a Friday night, and uh, they said, you're going to get a registered letter. The company has been sold, and you're out of a job. Uh, I called a downtown AA uh, club in Philadelphia and told them what was going on, and, and they said, you know, do you want us to come out? And I said, no. Uh, I'm getting on a plane. I'll be all right. When I got home, I called a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and told them about it. You know, the... Uh, one door closes, another one opens. Uh, you know, I've gone through a lot of jobs, and, and uh, you know, these things these things happen. Uh, but there is a grace of God that, that was just talked about here. Um, in the last 38 years, I've never filled out a resume. I've never filled out an application. One job would end, and, and somebody would call me and say, why don't you come with us? And that's how it's been. Uh, I was in Arizona. I had lost a job. We went to Arizona. And I called a man and, and I said, you know, can I visit your plant out there? And he said, yeah. I said, go take a look at it and see what you think of it. And I did. I gave him a report. He said, come to Providence and, and uh, let me know. I'll buy you lunch. And I went there and he said, why don't you come and fix some of this junk you've been selling me for the last 30 years? And, and I did. I went to Providence, Rhode Island every day for eight years. And I turned 65 and, uh, in October, and, and, and on November 11th, they called me and they said, Charlie, we're sorry to do this. Every improvement in this company, in this plant, you did, but we're eliminating your position. And I was gone. And the next night, I, I was to speak at St. John's in Waterbury, and I got very emotional because the, the impact of it hadn't, hadn't really hit me yet, you know. And, and again, God's grace. You know, my daughter, I have Crohn's disease and my daughter was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And she said I lost a job so I could be there to help her. You know, and not one door closes and another opens. And I, I people who knew me, uh, I would do a week in Cleveland or a week in California. The company that let me go, I went out to the Arizona plant and did a week for them out there. Because you people told me that if I do the right things, the right thing will happen. And it did. And it has. Uh, a young lady up in Thomaston bought a company, and she knew that I knew something about this equipment. She said, why don't you come up here and look at it and see if it's worthwhile pursuing. So I went up there, and and I, I did a study for her, and I told her what I thought. And, and Marilyn was saying to me things like, you're having way too much fun. You ought to get a real job. Um, <laughs> You know, this kind of thing. And, and uh, 
you know, uh, I said, Amy, I got to get a real job. And she said, you have one. You're starting. You, you work here. You know, I've been there for the last little over a year. And things come and go, you know. And, and um, I, I have to tell you that, that uh, you know, Dr. Bob, before he made any major decision, he always looked at the four absolutes. And, and I implemented that in my life. And, you know, the first one is honesty. Is it true or false? The second one is unselfishness. How will it affect the other fellow? The third one is love. Is it ugly or beautiful? And the fourth one is purity. Is it right or is it wrong? You know, and that's what I, I try to do today. I try to look at these things. Um, you know, it, it's funny. I have five grandchildren. Would you believe this? And, uh, you know, my, my youngest daughter came to me and said, Dad, I'm pregnant and I need your love and your support. And she had a baby. And, and uh, her and the young man tried to, to make it work and they bought a condo and they bought a house and and they came and, and she got my wife called me and she said, Nicole says she and Lena have to come home because it's not working out. And she wants to know what the conditions are. And I said, there are no conditions, you know, because you told me that love is unconditional. So she came home and she stayed with us for a while. And when she decided it wasn't ever going to work again, in fact, her ex just got married again um, for a number of times, but... Uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, and, and he comes from a good family and his family's been very supportive. So I can't, I can't, you know, I have to accept the things I can't change. You know, Dick lives right down the street in a convalescent home and, and, uh, Dick Barton and, and, uh, Brenda went to see him and she said, how can you sit here day in and day out? And he said, acceptance is the key. Acceptance. And acceptance is the key with me, you know. Uh, we're getting to that time, and, and I don't want to go over, but, you know, I got a, there are many versions of this. I got this one from White Standing Buffalo. And the story is about the Navajo tradition, tells of an old Navajo who told his grandson that sometimes he feels like there is fighting going on inside of him. The fight is between two wolves. One is evil. It is the wolf of anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, superiority, fear of healing my body and mind, fear of succeeding, fear of exploring what has been said by others to be true, fear of walking in others' moccasins and seeing glimpses of their reality through their eyes and their hearts, using empty excuses that in my heart knows to be false. The other wolf is good. It is the wolf of joy, of peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, empathy, caring for those who have helped me even though their efforts have not always been perfect, the willingness to forgive myself and others, and realizing that my destiny is in my hands. And the grandson thought for this and asked, But grandfather, which wolf wins? And the grandfather said, The wolf I choose to feed. You know, Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, I know that there are two emotions. One is love, one is fear. I can live in love, I can live in fear. It all depends on which wolf I choose to feed. You know, I don't drink, I still go to meetings, I don't do anything in mind and deed that I couldn't openly admit here. I am still a student of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am still a student of, the, of Emmett Fox, I am still a student of the other big book that Dr. Bob was so in love with. When I got here, I had no hope. You gave me hope. I did not know love. You taught me love. And you taught me the only way I could give people was to give it away. And I thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.